Vietnam and Interview is a four-part multimedia experience built on the documentary photography done by three-tour Marine veteran Mark C. Waskowitz. The photo book Thousand Yard Stare draws from the thousands of photographs made by Mark over the course of three combat tours. It takes an eyes wide open look at everyday life in country. The photo book will be published by Stackpole Books in 2016. No one knows how it feels to be working side by side. The memoir, Welcome to the Jungle, features a detailed chronology of Mark's combat tours, along with a wide-ranging collection of anecdotes. No one knows this is Mark introducing a live read. Sitting alone in my house a few years ago, late at night, I was thinking back to this incident and I realized how it never really leaves me, as some of these incidents don't. So I wrote him a letter, this person, Ode to Private Brainless. Oh, who were you? Eye to eye, one must die, but why? I still have that grenade you threw at me. It was a dud. The soundtrack was composed and recorded by Mark Waskowitz and Lee Jones. Recorded to resemble music popular in the late 60s, and written to touch on a range of day-to-day -day experiences commonplace in Vietnam, the soundtrack immediately garnered attention. The music was played on the National Mall as part of the 25th anniversary of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. The title track, War Speak, was featured on the prestigious Bear Family Retrospective Collection. Next stop is Vietnam. Tripwire, the film, combines the sights, sounds, and smells of Vietnam using Mark's photos cut to the tune, Truckin' It. Yeah, welcome to Vietnam, no turning back. Trucking it, trucking it down the road. Bugs everywhere and it's hot as hell. Trucking it, trucking it down the road. All this noise, man, what's that smell? Trucking it, trucking it, trucking it down the road. Oil feel like John Wayne riding high. Trucking it, trucking it down the road. This far out country flying by. The film is slated for completion in early 2016. And started firing away, and it jammed again. This stupid gun, I wanted to jump up and down on top of this son of a bitch. You got him. Nice gun, you know, like this. In the mid-90s, a PBS film crew recorded this reunion of Mark's brothers in arms. Then I remember the gunny. Gun about, keep it down! <laughs> These interviews are mixed with Mark's photographs, to illustrate the shared experiences of these men. They come down out of the sky, it was like God coming down out of the sky to us. That was salvation to us. That was one of our only salvations, helicopters. The blowing uh, dust and the womp, 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 womp. Mail call was the most exciting moment for it reminded me that I was not going to be here forever, that there was another place where I came from and I was going to go back to. When you seen the chopper coming in with the red bags hanging off the, hanging below it, and bring a smile to everybody's face. Mark and the PBS crew also filmed veterans groups during their pilgrimages to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in the 90s.
Mark took the same PBS crew to Vietnam. There were six guns. Where was the last gun? He revisited bases. The barbed wire all across the waterfront here. Met with former adversaries and located the battlefield where he had been injured and left for dead overnight. Recent interviews with Mark and his family shed light on post-traumatic stress and its effects on family dynamics. I've been working on this, my life's work, for over 25 years. One of the things this project has provided for me is a heightened sense of self-esteem. I have something to say that's worth hearing. It was maddening, you know, it, it was maddening to see somebody so wrapped up in this. You see vets that don't want to talk about it, and then you have somebody like Mark that won't stop talking about it. Behind all the, all the anger and stuff that my dad deals with, he's really, he's really a big softy. <laughs> he's a big baby, actually. I feel like uh, sometimes my dad would use that as uh, an excuse for his actions and for him to not take responsibility for himself and blame it on the war, you know. You know, and uh, that's bullshit. Going into the Marine Corps, a sensitive um, spiritual person, I think um, probably going there kind of actually tore his soul apart. The Interview Productions team features Oscar and Emmy-winning editors and composers. This unlikely pair created the soundtrack in 1992, and they are now the co-producers of Mark's four-part multimedia experience, Vietnam, an interview. For more information about the projects, please visit our website and Facebook pages. And keep an eye out for our Stackpole book release in 2016. Vietnam and Interview has been endorsed by the following organizations. I got an email from Dan Shea, who is a Veterans for Peace, uh, Chapter 72 here in Portland uh, member, and uh, he passed on Lee Jones's name and number and everything to me, and I connected up with him in order to do this. Dan Shea also produced, or uh, actually hosts, the Veterans for Peace Forum that's every fourth Saturday out at Metro East that's produced by Karma DeBella. Uh, most of the time it's, a, it's veterans issues just like what we're talking about here. But it, it, to me it was, it was really perfect because uh, this coming week, you know, November 11th at 11 o'clock, that's 11, 11, 11, is uh, the, the celebration of the, the end of World War II, Armistice Day. And it has kind of morphed into more of a Veterans Day now, but originally it was Armistice Day. And uh, would that it had stayed that way, but uh, we've gone, how many wars have we been into? I was just looking it up on the internet, and it's with 50 to 80 million people killed in World War II. 25 million of them, I think, were Russians. Uh, the majority of them, of all of them, were uh, civilians. So, you know, this this Iraq, Iraq and uh, Afghan and, and all this stuff going on in Yemen and all these places and all these civilians being killed, uh, wedding parties being killed, people being bombed from, from drones. It's nothing new that the civilians bear the brunt of it. Their government is just as culpable in their death as the people who are dropping the bombs that are on the other side. And uh, I don't know the, the fellow Mark's view. Uh, he says, and Lee had been saying this is not a political they're not taking any political stance. Well, we, we take a few political stances around here. And, uh, you know, war is criminal. War is a crime. War is a failure. Uh, and in my mind, and a lot of other people's minds, too, there's got to be ways to do things so that 50 to 80 million people don't die. You know, that you're dropping bombs. You know, like we say McCain's a big hero. He did what he did. Well, he also dropped bombs indiscriminately from the sky and killed people. Uh, this is, civilized people don't do this, in my mind anyway, and a lot of other people might think differently. Well, yeah, we're being attacked, we need to retaliate, we need to protect ourselves. Uh, if that option wasn't open, what would people do? And uh, we went to Vietnam, 
we didn't belong there. The French didn't belong there. And uh, like like the the guy in the control room, Bill was saying, you know, over there they don't call it the Vietnam War. They call it the American War. Before that, they probably called it the French War. So we're waiting for this phone call right now. God, I hope the phones work. We didn't test those. We were so busy trying to get the audio out here. There's a lot going on with, with this. Uh, Armistice Day is, is uh, probably in some ways the most important one of the year, and I don't think it's really, it's really uh, uh, celebrated as well as it should be. I'm trying to think the uh, May Day is not celebrated worldwide. It's not celebrated here as much as it is in other parts of the world. So we've got, uh, we've, we have some pictures that uh, we've actually been showing some of them there. That's, it looks like it's in an in airplane, people going to or coming back from Vietnam. Uh, that was what, the, a 10-year war, which we've already beat that out now in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, now we're going to be moving into Syria. You know, it just never ends. And, you know, who knows what they're te- how much they're telling us of what's really going on. Uh, I don't believe they ever tell us what's really going on. I wouldn't be surprised if the president didn't even really know what was going on. But anyway, we got the flashing light. We got, a, we got the caller. Uh, Mark, are you there? Hello, Mark, are you there? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, we connected. All right, I'm all right. right here. Hey, sorry about all the, all the bumps and grinds, but we did make this work. It only took us 15 minutes. But uh, the, uh, the video talked a lot about the situation, but we might as well just back up. This is Mark Waskowitz, and you're, you now live in, uh, uh, you sat down there out of Eugene, and that's where Lee Jones works. Now, is that picture that we just saw, was that Lee and you? Uh, I'm not uh, watching the screen, so I have no idea what you've seen. Oh, well, I sent you some pictures that, uh, that, that we were going to play. I don't know if you, you got that. If you saw a picture of a guy with a Grateful Dead shirt, that would be, uh, that was an old picture of uh, Lee Jones. Right. And a shorter guy with uh, uh, long hair uh, with a USMC shirt, that was me at the time. That's you? Well, uh, I'll get the crew in there. The, all, all the pictures, the first one, the first one of those pictures is the, uh, is the one we're talking about. We can get that one up there and see kind of who we're talking to here. They're going to now, work. They're working. That, that picture's uh, 25 years old, of course. Oh, all right. Well, yeah, you probably look the same, right? <laughs> no, I have no. I have a shaved head, buddy. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, but uh, so <laughs> that 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 and leaves the one with the long hair. <laughs> so I'll mention the crew again. Let's get that first picture up if we can on that list. I know they're probably in there trying to get everything all squared away after the debacle we had. But anyway, Mark, uh, they talked a little bit about it on the video, but you spent two or three tours, you said, in, in Vietnam, and this is kind of like your life's work providing the, uh, there we go, you're the one on the left there with the, U, with the US, USMC T-shirt, and the one on the right is Lee. That's right. All right. So that's who we're talking to live on the phone, Mark Waskowitz. And uh, how long ago did you decide to uh, start start this documentary? I decided to start it while I was still in Vietnam. I thought people would be immediately interested in learning about what we were doing on a day-to-day basis, what it was like for uh, us teenagers over there. I thought the moms and dads and the general civilian population would be really interested to know, uh, you know, what it was like, you know, getting up in the morning, how we lived, how we cooked our food, what our living conditions were like, and so on. Uh, It turned out that was not the case. In fact, uh, uh, the opposite was the case. People uh, were definitely not interested. They were anti-interested. And uh, I, I was very uh, saddened uh, at that. But, uh, but 20 years later, in the 80s, uh, mm-hmm. with the advent of the movie Platoon and the Hollywood breakthrough with uh, Vietnam movies becoming acceptable for the first time. Right. 
breaking the stigma of uh, we don't want to hear about the Vietnam War and all that, and suddenly it became uh, a serious uh, topic of interest. And uh, I began working on my project uh, a second time from a uh, professional Hollywood level at, at that time. I was working in Hollywood on a number of network TV shows as a music production manager, which uh, gave me the ins and outs of video production as well as the music production. Well, I, was, uh, I, was, I had uh, just earned a uh, master's degree in uh, music composition and Fermar on uh, three network TV shows and uh, began working on uh, the first elements of this project. I, I did so out of pocket uh, and with a seed money from uh, grassroots uh, organizations and people around me and veterans organizations that gradually became interested. Well, I can see how that uh, something like this could do. It would cost a lot of money and it would take an awful lot of work. Uh, you started this again, you said, in the 80s, so you've been at it for, what, 35 years now? Yes, sir. Wow. I have this a friend. Is, I have a this friend is who. My life's work. This is my bucket list. And when do you figure? I think that I think the video uh, said that you plan on being done in 2016. We expect to uh, complete the video next summer. Right, and uh, I think towards the end of that, it said something about there was two things that were going to be available soon. What was a, one was a soundtrack, and one was a book, maybe. Uh, well, all right. Uh, I took over two. I took over four thousand photographs and slides during my three tours in Vietnam. Out of those, we recently uh, spent two years compiling a coffee table photo book of museum quality, and we self-published over two hundred photographs. Uh, with our first press run, Stackpole Publishing, Stackpole Books, uh, found out about us. They gave us an immediate offer to publish, and they wanted us to enlarge the book by another 100. Wow. Now, just as of last week, completed the process of, of bringing the book up to over 300 uh, firm uh, publishing deal we've already been paid our uh, initial royalty advance. Well, so you're committed now, huh? <laughs> for sure. So, Absolutely. Uh, so is that, and, is that available now? No. Uh, oh, okay. The uh, original self-published uh, version of Thousand Yard Stare, the coffee table photo book from Vietnam in interview, one of the four multimedia elements of Vietnam and interview. The coffee table photo book is available at our website, www.vietnaminterview.com. Uh, and next summer, Stackpole Publishing expects to have the expanded hardcover 300 photo deluxe edition available uh, out there with the general uh, public. Uh, when those photographs were first being worked on, uh, I, I said, well, this is the basis of the video, so we need some songs. Since I'm an uh, Emmy award-winning music uh, composer and arranger, I sought uh, a singer-songwriter uh, to partner with, and I found somebody named Lee Jones uh, 25 years ago. And uh, he and I uh, wrote uh, the songs uh, that are the soundtrack of Vietnam and Interview. The soundtrack is titled War Speak, mm -hmm. and it is available. It's on CD Baby and Reverb Nation and available at our website, and it rocks. It is uh, very much like the music we would have heard in Vietnam intentionally done so right we, re we recorded instruments 
And, uh, you know, I was recording in the 60s already, and I got out old microphones and old uh, guitars and basses and uh, old funky, funky stuff, and we got that old authentic rock and roll mm. You know, with all, uh, Rolling Stones and uh, yeah. early Beatles and... Uh, with all the analog equipment rather than the digital. That's a fact. We recorded on a half-inch reel-to-reel eight-track. Oh, uh, yeah. In a trailer at, in, the, in the mobile home in, uh, in the woods in Washington. Well, I can remember all those folks that were over in Vietnam when they, when they came back and they came home. They were sending over all that... All that electronic equipment, a lot of it was in big Akai reel-to-reels and those yep. enormous speakers and all those, because a lot of them packed it full of marijuana, too, at the same time. But there was a, a lot going on. I remember a lot of equipment. Yep. Well, uh, so, there's so a... the coffee table, photo book, and the soundtrack are already done and available, uh, and they are the basis of the, uh, the video. Now... I took a PBS television crew around the country back in the early 90s, and we interviewed a bunch of friends who served with me. And so we have talking heads uh, to uh, amplify the topics and the, some of the, share some of the stories uh, that I experienced uh, in, in the video. That, that's in the, the video that you're talking of the, the uh, Vietnam interview. I want folks to know that that is not interview, I-N-T-E-R. It's I-N-N-E-R. So it's Vietnam interview, which is exactly what this is. is an interview of, the, of, the, uh, of what went on in Vietnam. You said you wanted to let people know how people lived and ate and slept and how, what, what went on over there on the inside. Did you, continue, right. did you continue with that same theme now? That's a fact. Uh, Lee and I are political opposites. We don't share our political <laughs> views, and we don't uh, infuse them into the project. Um, we, uh, it is strictly an apolitical look and what it was like for a kid next door to go to war, and it's the same as the guys today and the guys before us long ago, and for all of us that went to Vietnam. Uh, it was different for everyone, but it was in many ways the same. And I'm talking about the commonality of the experience and that sort of thing. I'm not talking about uh, trying to recreate the history of it, or put big maps on the wall and show what units were where. And I'm not talking about what a geopolitical uh, thing should or should not have happened. That, that's for other people to write about. I'm just writing about what I know about. And what I know about is what happened with the guy on my left and the guy on my right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's, I think that's a tact that we don't hear much about. We hear a lot about the lamentation of the, 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 the protests here or, the, or how war is hell and all that different thing. And there might be some of that war is hell part to it, but it sounds to me like it, uh, it's a complete different uh, tact that I've ever seen before uh, taken for this, vi this documentary. And, uh, yes. Looking forward to seeing the finished product. No, we're, we're... I, I believe it is unique. I believe uh, I've created a new uh, method of uh, delivering docs to, uh, to consumers. Uh, we're talking about a coffee table photo book, a memoir book, a soundtrack of original songs that tell specific themes and stories of my experiences, and a video film documentary, all four pieces in one box, all together called Vietnam in Interview, but four separate pieces to the puzzle. So these songs were, uh, is, that, what, is that what Lee Jones is contributing? Is he writing these songs? Is he, yeah, also, he, is he also playing and singing them, or has he got different artists? He is the singer-songwriter 
I am the arranger and instrumentalist. I play uh, about 80% of the instruments on the soundtrack. Um, and he plays uh, guitar and does all the singing and arranged all the harmonies. And he, uh, there's one, uh, he sings all the songs except one. There is a girl cast song uh, called No One, um, uh, called, um, uh, and what, what's it called? Uh, uh, loaded Gun, Loaded Gun. Uh, it's about uh, sleeping with a loaded gun. It's uh, it's a Vietnam vet's wives' point of view of living with the war. Uh, Lee interviewed my wife and spent a couple of days writing that song with her uh, to uh, uh, to portray and communicate uh, the the wife's perspective, which is very valid. And, and very affected by uh, the effects of marrying a veteran from the war. Sure, I completely understand that. You know, we've been cycling through some of these pictures. Did you get those pictures that I sent you? Yes. So uh, we're looking at, uh, right now, there's the uh, a couple of folks, it looks like some uh, indigenous people maybe of Vietnam on a blue bus maybe? Yep. So what, uh, what's the story just, on that, that one? Just, that's just a random roadside picture. We're going through congested traffic. I stick my camera out the window and take a picture. Uh -huh. That's what it was like all around us. The hustle and bustle of uh, on the road. Some places were uh, packed with people. Some places were, I, you know, I, I drove a truck for three months. I uh, was with Regimental Artillery Headquarters for about six or seven months. I was with various small artillery units out in the bush, fire support bases, for about a total of six months. Um, I, I spent uh, probably about a month at Division and Regimental Headquarters in uh, Da Nang, uh, you know, totally secure and safe. And then I spent about 11 months out in the bush with the infantry. So I, I have many experiences, uh, and uh, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I'm just one of the guys that was over there, and I'm just sharing what I experienced. And, and however much of it uh, touches another veteran's heart, However much of it, uh, uh, you know, evokes images and memories uh, that he can share with others, uh, that's what it's all about. Yes, I see. Well, the, the picture that just got up now is, uh, is looks like a young Vietnamese boy there. I don't know, he's 10 or something like that with a couple soldiers around him. Uh, do you remember the story on that one? Um. Maybe he's wounded, possibly? No, no. I, he's it, just, just a roadside kid hanging another, out with the soldiers. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I imagine. There's also another picture there. It looks like it's taken in an airplane. That uh, one? It, it helicopters, yeah. Oh, that's a helicopter. All right. I know that one of the videos later, it starts out talking about the helicopters. But, yeah, uh, yeah, we flew in helicopters a lot. Yeah, that, that to me is what Vietnam was all about, was the helicopters. That was the ones that went in there and the, the gunboats, they called them, and the, they would rescue people. And, and uh, a lot of the situations that uh, when they were, they were actually giving cover for the, for the infantry that was in there. So, so were you, uh, when you were out in the, in the bush, as you call it, the jungle, I always called it, uh, were you uh, infantry? infantry? I was an artillery forward observer. Ah, okay. So that means you get out in, in, in front of the artillery and uh, find spots that they were supposed to send the, uh, send the, the, send the uh, artillery? I got out in front of the infantry. Oh, hey, that sounds like a dangerous job. It's, it, it's uh, one of the most dangerous jobs. Uh, you know, everybody's got this oh, life expectancy of four seconds. or I, I don't know about all that stuff. 
you know, I, I uh, was a foreign observer for 11 months and uh, never got hit out in the bush. Now you were like probably I, careful. <laughs> no, I was not careful. Really? <laughs> I, I was uh, very aggressive. And uh, we were very hard charging. The unit I chose to go out with uh, was uh, 2nd Battalion, 5th Fallujah in uh, Iraq. 5th uh, Marines is the most highly decorated regiment, and 2nd Battalion that I was with is the most highly decorated battalion in the history of the Marine Corps, in the history of the Vietnam War as well. Uh, they're the go-to guys, and that's why I volunteered to extend my tour to go out with them. So that, that's, that's a different uh, battalion. Than, I've always heard of the Bloody Red One, but this is, a, this is another one that you're talking about. The Bloody Red One was an a Army unit. Ah, and you were Marines, of course, right, yeah. Right. So, so I was thinking we might cycle through. There's another picture of the, of the same picture of the of the uh, helicopter. I was just wondering, there's also one of, uh, uh, there we are, that's the one I'm, I'm in right in the middle of this one. There's some people just staring at you, uh, smiling at the camera, looks like. A fellow in the background, what looks like a bazooka over his shoulder. Is that, yeah. an, is that another yeah. one you just shot that's from the, the truck? That's, that's one of my favorite pictures. That's Sergeant Marshall on the left, and my very best friend, uh, Sergeant Donnie Serwick on the right, and uh, a, a number of the guys from Fox 2-5 uh, in the background. That is a bazooka, a World War II-style bazooka uh, in the background. We, we used it for blowing up uh, enemy bunkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they worked real well at that. Uh, we were out in a place called the Funans, uh, outside of a uh, or outside of a military complex called Anwa, which uh, became a rather built-up area after 1968. Before that, it was pretty small. Well, that's what war does. It builds places up as well as tears places down. Yeah. So, you know, I know that you didn't, but there we go. There's, there's a picture, uh, the, the PBR picture, past Blue Ribbon. Now, this is probably not oh, something. I love that picture. I love <laughs> I bet that. you do. You know, I mean, everybody talks, oh, you went to Vietnam. Oh, it must have been horrible. Well, there were bad times, but there were good times. But look at that picture. That's a bunch of us that are getting ready to go home, and everybody in that picture uh, had gone through training with me. They were friends from a year back, and we had all chosen to extend our tour an extra six months. So we all got 30 days leave to go home for Christmas, uh, free leave, not counting our regular accrued leave, uh, a free basket leave, they called it. And uh, we were all together in Da Nang. That was the night before we were to go home, and we were drinking ice-cold PBR uh, <laughs> at the Enlistment Club in Da Nang. We were safe and sound. We had handed in our weapons. We didn't have any guns with us, and nor any need for them because we were that far back in the rear. And we were drinking 15 cents a can <laughs> ice-cold PBR. I mean, ice-cold, you open that thing up, it's about... That 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 where it was oh, that was just awesome. I guess PBR is making a comeback. I was told it's getting popular again. Well, you know, been, uh, Lee and I have been talking to them. Look at that picture. Uh, they ought to make a billboard out of that, man. <laughs> yeah, you could um, make a few bucks off that and put it into your documentary. Well, you know, uh, welcome to the use of it. If they give uh, Lee and me a pallet of PBR each year. Yeah, <laughs> a pallet, huh? You sound like a beer a drinker. <laughs> so you still there? I'm still here. Yeah, you've been, you know, you cut out once in a while. We lose a few words, but it's not really that much of a problem. We're still getting a full, the full uh, just of what you're trying to say. 
So we're going to have to kind of wrap this up pretty soon here. Uh, we've right. got two, yeah. two more videos to play. Uh, what years were you there in Vietnam? I was there 67, 68, and 69. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, we're doing the show at the theater, uh, you know, uh, coming up here, and you're, you're advertising that, and that's what this is all about. And, uh, you know, we're going to uh, have an opportunity for other vets to have uh, an open forum uh, for show and tell and, uh, and the questions and answers. Uh, Lee is going to play some music from, from our show. We're going to show some of these uh, vignettes, uh, um, videos, uh, clips from our show. Uh, I'm going to do live reads from the book. I'm going to do uh, book signings. Anybody wants to buy some books or CDs, uh, I'll be signing them if you want them, if you want them signed. And uh, uh, I, I love to do live reads. I'm a storyteller at heart. And uh, there's, there's some really cool stories uh, that, uh, that are to be told. And there's, uh, we've done a lot of these shows now. Uh, and the, the following night, we're going to be up in uh, Portland. And uh, the following week, we're going to be in uh, uh, Jackson, North Carolina, at a, at a private club, Sergeant Major uh, Cevente, who has the world's largest collection of military paraphernalia right outside the gate of Quantico uh, Marine Corps Base. My old company commander, uh, retired Colonel uh, Dave Brown, is hosting us and putting on a fundraiser for us. This show is going around the country. We're going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona in January. Uh, so come on out. This is not some local yokel thing. Uh, you'll be pleased. You'll be happy. You'll be saddened, you'll be enriched, you'll be uh, fulfilled. When are you going to be in Portland for this, this uh, tour? Um, let's see, we're, uh, we're in uh, Springfield, what, uh, Sunday night? This, this coming Sunday? Yeah. Uh, uh, so Monday we'll be in, uh, at uh, Portland State. That would be the, uh, let's see, what is this, the uh, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th? So it would be a week from, be the 9th then? Or a week from the 9th? No, it would be the 9th. Okay. Now, is that information on your uh, website? Yep. So the Vietnam inter VietnamInterview.com, they can find out about where this tour is going and when they can uh, check this out then. That's a fact. All right. That's good to know. That's good to know. Well, before we get going here, I, uh, I was also sent a piece of paper, which was a letter by Rebecca Flynn, Associate Director. Uh, you know what this is about? She's thanking uh, folks about the, as uh, involved in a partnering with the University of Oregon and uh, talking about the Returning Vets Project. Is this, is this having anything to do with you? Is that something just... Yeah. Yes, that's a fact. Okay, uh, a little bit now, about that. Uh, Lee Jones normally does the interviews, and he was the one that puts together uh, all, all these things. So please forgive me if I have uh, neglected to give somebody credit where it's due or if I have for, uh, gotten to mention someone that I should. Uh, he's unavailable tonight, so... Uh, I'm doing the best I can uh, with this. I normally do uh, the storytelling and uh, the creative uh, leadership of the team, and Lee normally puts together, you know, uh, the nuts and bolts of it and uh, who we're working with and stuff. We are donating a portion of the proceeds uh, to another organization. I know that. I, I don't recall who it is. But uh, I remember at the time that uh, I was approached on it, I said, oh, hell yes, we're, we're going to support that. That sounds good. All right. Well, that's probably what this is all about then. I was just kind of curious. 
But anyway, Mark, I really thank you for calling in and, and uh, commend you on the work you're doing. This is, uh, I think this is, uh, I, like I said earlier, a new theme that uh, people can maybe finally feel good about. I, you know, I, I think I honor the war and I hate, I honor the warrior, but I hate the war. And I, yep. I, I think that everybody that uh, can maybe get some fresh insight into into that era of our, like we said earlier in our phone call, that was a that was a very traumatic time in, in American history, and uh, very divisive, very divisive. It tore it tore the fabric of our whole culture apart, tore families apart. Brothers and sisters in the same family would refuse to speak to each other o over their stance on. The, on the war. It, it was terrible. It was absolutely horrible. It probably hasn't been that way since the Civil War, which was, you know, almost, a, what, right at 100 years ago. Yes. At, at 100 years ago from when the war started, anyway, because I know that was around the 1860s. So, well, all right, I guess we probably should should end this. I really appreciate you calling in and putting up with our snafu there. And, uh, no and uh, I'll be in touch with both you and Lee sometime, you know, over the weekend. And uh, this is just has been a really interesting project you're doing here, and I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, seeing more of it. So right on, right, all right. On. And what whatever more we can do, uh, whatever more you're interested in hearing, uh, you know, get the word out is is what it's all about. And I appreciate the opportunity and the uh, uh, the. Um, uh, you know, the um, the outlet uh, to get the word out there. All thank, right. Thank you very much, Jim. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, that was interesting. It wasn't easy not to get political, <laughs> but I did my best. So uh, we got a couple more videos. Let's run one more of those. We got two of them. Let's do the keeper if we can. I don't remember which one's which. They come down out of the sky. It was like God coming down out of the sky to us. That was salvation to us. That was one of our only salvations. Helicopters. The blowing uh, dust and the womp, 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 womp. Mail call was the most exciting moment for it reminded me that I was not going to be here forever, that there was another place where I came from and I was going to go back to. When you seen the chopper coming in with the red bags hanging off the, hanging below it, and bring a smile to everybody's face. I was somewhat uh, removed from a lot of the, um, the troops getting Dear John letters. At the time I came to Vietnam, uh, I was, uh, had been going steady with a girl for some time and she sent me a letter uh, telling me that there was another guy that she was uh, with. Um, that, uh, I never saw her again. Bill was married and we were over there. We were over there about five months and he came to me, he says, read this letter. He, he says, well, what do you make of this? And I came, I was frank with him, and I said, Billy, I think you're gonna be taken out of the ball game. I think she's getting ready to dump you. Nicest guy in the whole world, but it, he, it, he changed. He, he became very bitter towards things. They would have to go back in their fire teams and in their squads, and uh, especially, especially if they had to go out on night ambushes and. Uh, I would know that I have what I would have one or two guys out of that squad that they weren't really thinking of uh, what they were doing. They'd be thinking more or less of what was going on back home. When I had you, I had the power of love. Your sweet love like me 
If I could dream of your morning Help pull me through Every sunrise Another day closer to home oh. Well, war is hard on people. Well, it's hard on the people that fight the wars. It ain't hard on the people that start them. Uh, that should be turned around, I think. Uh, war sucks. And uh, it isn't just the war. It's what happens when people come home, too, as we found out with all the different uh, hundreds of suicides a week or a month or 22 a day or something like that over the, the war right now. I think we got about a minute, and then the next video is going to be like, I want to thank Mark for calling in. I want to thank Lee Jones for the work he's doing and, and connecting us up. Remember that this coming uh, Wednesday is the is the um, Armistice Day, and uh, we'll uh, see. We got five hundred five hour five minutes and forty six seconds, so we got about another minute here. Uh, this is pretty interesting to me. I thought this was excellent. I really appreciated the fact that he could call in, and this is a whole different perspective. And like I said, it, 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 he said they didn't get political, and there's a lot of room for politics in this. You know, uh, war is war is po very political, but the fact remains that uh, there's other ways of looking at it too. And uh, what he did and he is doing with this documentary is very commendable, and I appreciate that. So we're down to just about a little over, uh, a little under six minutes. So I want to thank folks for tuning in. We got a couple more shows before Thanksgiving. We're going to be off that Friday, probably, and then we'll come back, and uh, we're into December already. So, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Good night for now. Sergeant Marshall's ordeal. <laughs> it was early into Operation Mead River, early into December 1968, and much later than Sergeant Marshall realized. Sergeant Marshall, he, he, he was a little bit different. He would get grouchy at times and uh, pretty strict. I remember him as a leader in battle, a hero. I also remember him as a lifer, as a prick. You wouldn't see him laugh too often. Of course, those are admirable qualities to older Marines, but to us kids, it was reason to be placed on the radar screen of our payback machine. So me and Mark, we, we sat in for the night and got, slept together that night on a poncho liner. I was repeatedly awakened during that half-sleep, half-awake time, lying in my two-man hooch of plastic ponchos to the ever-so-gentle finger-prodding sensation 
to the portion of my body laying closest to the ground. With sleep being a rare commodity, I repeatedly tried to ignore the nearly imperceptible finger poking. I half dreamt that I was feeling it. Finally, in a thrashing, spinning, muttering motion, I rose up, rolled back the ground cover poncho. There was these huge, huge worms under this poncho liner. I mean, worms that we've, we've never seen nothing like this in our lives, worms this big. We thought night crawlers were big, but these were like four times the size of night crawlers. It looked like an asparagus farm. Huge earthworms having feasted for years on the corpses below us. Did I mention we were sleeping in a cemetery? were sensing our, my, body heat and seeking entry to the warmth they knew lay only micro inches away. I was disgusted, yet fatigued, so I slept. In the morning, of course, everybody gets up and we rolled up everything and... So we played cards, wrote letters, visited, and even had time to think. Ha! The very bane of every lifer. Never, ever let the troops have time to think. And we just happened to glance over and look over and there's Sergeant Marshall. He's in a hammock and uh, he's sleeping. He was sound asleep in his olive green canvas hammock strung between two small tipping banana trees. He almost looked like a fellow banana in his hammock. How peaceful, how vulnerable, how tempting, how irresistible. <laughs> so I looked at Mark, Mark looked at me and I think we both thought about it at the same time. Hey, let's get a handful of these worms and put them in the hammock. So I, then I says, no, nah, no, nah, maybe, maybe he'll get pissed off and either jump up and start shooting. Sergeant Marshall was totally obsessed with a phobic fear of creepy crawly things, especially slithery snake-like ones. About five minutes later we thought about this again and we said, now nah, we gotta do this. We burst nearly out loud with impish laughter. Donnie hung up a bunch of foot-long worms the size of your index finger. So he was in his hammock, he had his poncho line laying over him. I tied the grommet eyes of that poncho together underneath Marshall's hammock. He looked like a sausage or a tamale wrapped in corn husks or hot dog in a bun in a wrapper or a lifer right where we wanted him. <laughs> ha, it was great. Donnie and I poured literally dozens of the hideous flesh-seeking giant earthworm body hunters into both of the tiny restricted openings at the head and foot of Marshall's hammock taco. And we went back and sat down and a few of the guys couldn't figure out what the hell we were doing. <laughs> and finally, the hammock started moving and Sergeant Marshall was waking up. We all knew it was about to happen, rustling, tossing, slowly at first, building a momentum and intensity that shortly gave way to screams and curses, wailing, flailing. We see a leg kick out one side and an arm kick out the other side, screaming, yelling, this thing is getting all twisted up and getting ripped to shit. <laughs> and he come flying out of this. Thing. Ripping apart the entire banana taco tamale hot dog in a heroic final thrash. Grabbed his, grabbed his M16, <laughs> all pissed off, no helmet, no nothing on, and walked around to everybody screaming, Who the fuck did this? And nobody would tell him, nobody would say a word. We thought it was so funny, but yet when he came up and asked everybody, we just looked at him with a straight face. We, we would not smile. It was beautiful. <laughs> it was nearly epic in payback proportion. The occasional chortlings and choking sounds of stifled laughter only heightened Marshall's commitment of delivering justice. <laughs> I, think he may, he, I think he may have kind of knew a little bit, but he didn't want to come over and just say, okay, you two did it. I think he might have had an idea we did it, but he was scared real scared and we, we just thought it was the, the funniest thing at the time. But it isn't until now that he can know the rest of the story.